Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Chambers. I am the interim associate um, vice president for the Division of Student Life and Dean of Students. And on behalf of the Wellbeing You Initiative and the Division of Student Life, welcome and thank you for joining us today at our annual Wellbeing You Speaker Series. I want to give you a little bit of history about Wellbeing You. So Wellbeing You began in 2013 under the name Mind Matters. And that was when Dr. William Covino became Cal State LA's seventh president. President Covino, along with his spouse Debbie, had two primary goals for the program. One, to reduce the stigma of needing help with mental health while increasing access. And two, to create more awareness among students of the many campus resources that support their well-being and success. President Covino began increasing the number of psychological counselors available at the Counseling and Psychological Services, also known as CAPS, so that students' wait times were dramatically improved. And then Debbie collaborated with campus partners to connect what was then My Matters to campus partners including, um, I mentioned CAPS and our Student Health Advisory Committee, also known as SHAC, and also helped to bring in our Mental Health First Aid Certification Program, in addition to expanding programming. And over the years, the Wellbeing You initi Initiative created um, this speaker series, two well-being classrooms, the Janice Cordova Garden of Wellbeing, a podcast series, a student video series, and then a student art contest. And if you haven't been over to the garden lately, please check out the art that is displayed on the glass. It's just phenomenal. And then this week, or we started last week and we're continuing to this week, we're celebrating Wellness Week. I think we recently had the author Alex L. join us, which for a fabulous full day, and today, we get to recognize Wellbeing You champions. And these are three individuals um, we are recognizing for their contributions to the Cal State LA community, for creating a culture of well-being. And we are hearing from the sports psychologist, Dr. Carrie Hastings, and wide receiver, Lance McCutcheon, of the LA Rams football organization. And I have to give honor and tribute to where it's due. And so I want to recognize Dr. Debbie Covino. Her contributions to the Wellbeing You Initiative has helped us as a community to fight stigma. Yes, <laughs> fight stigma attached to mental health. Let me do this real quick. <laughs> so, come on up, Fred. So, let me, I want to recognize you. So, Debbie's contributions to the Wellbeing You Initiative has helped us as a community to fight stigma attached to mental health. She's helped our campus community to be trained and educated on best practices that support the care of individuals who may be experiencing a crisis. Most notably, your advocacy over the last 10 years has brought additional resources that support the wellness of students as well as each other. On behalf of the Wellbeing You Steering Committee and with deep appreciation, we honor you, Dr. Covino, and for your 10 years of dedicated service. just want to say how embarrassing. I was not expecting this. I'm very grateful. It's very kind of you. And um, thank you to all, everyone over the last 10 years who has supported Mind Matters and Wellbeing You. It's been a pleasure to work with everyone, every single one of you. You've done so much good for the campus. And um, you know, it's been my pleasure to do this volunteer work for the campus. It's meant so much to me, and it's given me so much joy 
seeing students with the dogs and seeing, you know, um, all the benefits that come. The in the garden events have been wonderful. The students have enjoyed the dancing and uh, painting and meditation and yoga. I think Eddie the Eagle was out there doing yoga with the students a couple weeks ago and it was so touching <laughs> and beautiful. So anyway, it's been my pleasure and I thank all of you. So thank you. Okay. Can I get some credit for that gift, do you, do you think? Yes, he's been my partner in all of this, of course. Debbie, <laughs> Debbie, Debbie I'm, I'm glad, that, I didn't know that was gonna happen either. I'm glad, though, Debbie has been the driving force in all this from day one when we arrived on campus. Uh, we were focused on student well-being, and so here you all are, and we're about to uh, enter commencement season, and to have 10 commencement ceremonies in li a little over three weeks, and by that point, when we finish those 10 ceremonies, over this last decade, we'll have had 100, uh, 100 commencement ceremonies. 100, nice round figure, I like that. And I think that that equates to lots and lots of students, including many of you in this room. Well-being Champions is a new, newish uh, award that we started last year, right? Year before last, year before last, yeah. year before last. Last year we, we attached a $500 prize to it, and this year we attach a $500 prize to it, and that's, generally because Wellbeing You has been so well received by our philanthropic community, our donors, that we've been able to establish a very sizable endowment for student well-being that not only generates these awards, but generates these events, generates uh, uh, the, the costs of programming, and, uh, and also uh, has some bearing on the resources in uh, our counseling and psychological services office. So that's gonna be a foundation that will grow over the years, and it has everything to do uh, with the support for well-being that comes from everyone here and everyone in the community who have really wanted to step up and contribute to it. And if you haven't been over to the Cordova Garden of Well-Being, right, uh, over in between the Career Center and the Student Health Center, go over there, it's a beautiful place, great place to sit around, a lot of, a lot of people will be taking pictures during commencement week at the garden. Uh, it's there to soothe you and to inspire you and to help you sort of reset. Uh, so, uh, so I hope you get over there if you haven't already, and if you have already, keep going. And watch for the special events in the garden. Yeah. They, again, dancing, painting, yoga, meditation, all kinds of fun stuff. So. Right. Yes, and I've been involved, of course, in all the <laughs> dancing and, and all, the, all the yoga and, uh, and all that. Okay, we have award winners. This was a highly competitive uh, process. Uh, we had great, great applications. Uh, the, the committee that made the decisions had, had a tough, tough decisions to make, uh, and I think our recipients this year are all wonderful, uh, a student recipient, staff recipient, faculty recipient. And first, I want to cite our student recipient uh, who uh, has been integral to a program that I'm just learning about, the Golden Eagle Physical Activity Mentoring Program. It's, it's a peer-led, so student-led, right, Psycho exercise psychology program uh, that, uh, that uh, trains students in exercise psychology, counseling techniques, non-dieting approaches to health, and provides one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, in the Cal State community and beyond. In just three semesters, they've served 75 unique clients, offered more than 200 sessions to, uh, to student clients, and really gained a lot of traction. And this recipient uh, was an initial, uh, uh, an initial peer mentor in the first cohort. 
And as one of his recommenders says, he is a once in a lifetime type of student that every professor dreams of having. You'll want to get that on a plaque somewhere so you can use it. That's right, that's right. He is, uh, he uh, received a, uh, received a uh, BS in kinesiology last spring and is now working on a single subject teaching credential and his name is Javier Valencia. You've got it. Here he comes. All right, our, uh, our staff award winner uh, is, uh, is mainly responsible for, uh, in athletics, in the athletics program, uh, injury care and prevention, but she's always made it a priority to ensure that our student athletes' mental health is equally addressed. So she creates all kinds of programs in the athletics department and in the athletic training uh, facility uh, with posters and with interaction that really indicate that the facility itself is a safe space for everyone. Our, our student athletes are a diverse core of wonderful people and recognizing their differences and helping them to feel welcome every day is, uh, is, is a, a primary effort. Uh, our student athletes trust this uh, awardee and they see her as an ally and it is wonderful to come onto campus and know that there's at least one person, maybe lots of people I hope, that you can trust and who you see as an ally. It really makes every day, I think, uh, uh, a special day. So, staff winner, the assistant athletic trainer, Alyssa Veneman. It's clear that in true athletic fashion that Alyssa brought a cheering section along, along with her. I, I, yeah, there, there they are. There they are, right? Okay, okay. Our faculty awardee is, uh, is another outstanding example of the dedication that our faculty have to the well-being and success of our students. Uh, some, uh, some quotes, uh, she uses innovative elements of classroom pedagogy that seek to reduce stress and anxiety and promote a receptive learning environment. Uh, and this is what her classrooms are like. She has developed courses such as a course called the Sociology of Trauma, Memory, Resilience, Healing, and Social Repair. Uh, to bring students, student awareness to uh, issues of, of social memory, of trauma and human rights, of reconciliation, uh, and sort of looking at a diversity of settings that people find themselves in and the ways in which they might uh, address their experience in those settings to, uh, to deal with these issue, issues. In 2022, she, uh, as, a, as a former, Debbie and I both former English majors, uh, we're happy to know that she began to use poetry to bring hope into the classroom. And, uh, and it created a kind of uh, sense of creative voice and self-confidence that's been very beneficial for students. And perhaps the most significant example of her integration of well-being into university life is a collective project called the Public Mural Art Project, initiated in 2019 and brought to, brought to fruition 
in the subsequent years. It originated from her work in the Department of Sociology and in the Latin American Studies program, where she engaged students in her classes uh, and in other classes uh, to paint, uh, to, to brainstorm on mural designs and uh, work to create a mural representing student experiences and the knowledge of migration and other issues. The murals in the campus library, uh, we, uh, we hope that it is a source of hope to all of those who have some sense of oppression and it demonstrates that our winner, our awardee today, has indeed shown outstanding leadership and initiative to educate the campus community about wellness practices through student organizations, through her pedagogy, and through her everyday example of that dedication. From the Department of Sociology, Professor Gabriela Fried. truck to bring that down yeah yeah and there's more uh, today we are so very pleased to have uh, with us uh, dr. Carrie Hastings who uh, is uh, specializes in mental skills and performance enhancement for athletes uh, psychological and neuropsychological testing and individual therapy for people of all ages. Uh, if any of you do would like some attention to your mental skills and performance enhancement, uh, we'll have a little booth set up at, no, not really, not really. Like Lucy, right? And peanuts, psychological help, five cents, right? Dr. Hastings is a certified mental performance consultant with the Association for Applied Sports Psychology and is listed in the United States Olympic Committee Sports Psychology and Mental Training Registry. That is a long title. You, you have to have like three business cards to put that on, right? I think. And uh, Dr. Hastings uh, focuses much of her work. She has a practice in Westlake Village, but focuses much of her work and attention as the mental health clinician for the Los Angeles Rams. You may have heard of them. Uh, they are, I know you think about Cal State LA athletics first, but the Rams actually have a reputation. And, uh, and we're so happy to have both Dr. Hastings here and a, uh, a, uh, an athlete from the Rams who will be zooming in, I think. And I've asked, uh, I've asked our athletic director to bring all of the ath uh, athletes with in interesting neuroses uh, to, this, uh, to this gathering today, and they'll all stand, no, they won't do that, will they, Daryl? They won't tell their stories. Anyway, we're so delighted. I mean, we, we've worked over the months so eagerly to uh, get Dr. Hastings here to work, uh, to talk with all of you and tell you about her work and about the challenges uh, that she faces and about the successes and about the approaches and all of that good stuff. So please help me welcome Dr. Carrie Hastings. Welcome. Forgot to run this. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to introduce myself and then I'll let Lance uh, introduce himself. He's currently um, in a wardrobe change from uh, working out and getting ready to hop on the Zoom. Um, so uh, I know they're logged in, so hurry up, Lance. I know you can hear this. Uh, 
So actually, and Lance and I teamed up uh, not too long ago towards the, edge, towards the end of our season for um, the My, My Cause, My Cleats initiative that, that the league does every year. And he and two other of our players had chosen mental health organizations or suicide prevention organizations. And so the, uh, the team had us do a little round table just talking about uh, why we think this is important and sharing some stories and, um, and really just advocating for total wellness. I think it's so powerful for anyone, fellow uh, teammates or you know, those looking up to these players to hear that from, from folks who are their role models and, um, and you know, to really increase the buy-in for these resources and decrease the stigma and show that, you know, hey, it's, it's not only okay, but let's make it cool. I mean, these guys are benefiting from it every day. And maybe not this past year, but two years ago, uh, we really, uh, we reached the top when we won the Super Bowl, but we will forget about last year. Um, so this is just um, a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, um, in the mountains, in the sticks, and uh, I went to um, high school where I played tennis and track um, and ended up uh, really kind of specializing in, in track. At the time, we had a cinder track still, um, and so now they don't anymore, but um, I will never forget the first time I ran a track meet. Um, I was a hurdler, and I ran the 100-meter hurdles, and then um, if you've never seen a track meet, which is pretty much a day-long commitment, um, the 300 hurdles are a little while later, and, um, and I did some relays as well. Um, so after I had done the 100-meter hurdles and then um, was kind of just getting ready for one of the relays, uh, one of my coaches came up and said, hey, they're you know, they're calling for the 300 hurdles, are you ready? And I said, what? He said, the 300 hurdles, you, you know you're running that. I said, no, no one ever told me that. They had forgotten to coach me on that event. One of the coaches thought the other was coaching me, and that coach thought the other was coaching me, and so I had no practice doing that particular hurdles race. And I thought, well, I know how to hurdle. I, I can do the 100 meter hurdles, how different can it be? Well, 300 meters is about three quarters of the way around the track versus just one straightaway. Um, and so it does take some strategy, but I just winged it and went out and I just took off full sprint and, um, and the hurdles are also a different, they're a little bit lower, so that, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same. And I, I learned that pretty quickly as I rounded the first turn and I clipped one of the hurdles and just face planted on the cinder track. And so I had bloody knees, bloody elbows, and you know, obviously more than that, my pride was hurt. You could hear the gasp from the crowd, like, oh, you know, they knew it was bad. And, um, but in that moment, I had a choice. I could lie there and just try to bury my head in the sand. I could get up, walk off the track, nurse my injuries, or I could get up and try to finish the race um, and not settle for a DQ. So I chose the last option um, with blood dripping down my knees. I, I somehow managed to get over the last few hurdles and I, I crossed the finish line. But I told myself, never ever will I go into something unprepared. And so, you know, even though, um, you know, whatever you could say, my coaches should have done this, should have done that, but it really helped me learn the lesson of, you know, taking responsibility for your own endeavors and doing the work. And um, that's kind of uh, what happened through my journey by the time the opportunity came to um, potentially work for the Rams. I had done anything and everything possible to be the best sports psychologist I could be, the best mental health clinician, and, and then it was just the timing worked out, and it, I think it's been a good fit both ways. Um, but after high school, I, I went to the University of Notre Dame and ran track there, um, hurdles again and sprints and relays, 
And, um, and after that, I lived in New York City for a little while before moving out to California. And I attended Pepperdine Graduate School, got my master's in psych, and then my doctorate in clinical psych, and eventually got my graduate certificate in sports psychology. I always knew I wanted to work with athletes. I think just having been an athlete, um, we didn't have sports psychologists where I was back then. Um, now, you know, Notre Dame has at least three, maybe four, um, and some of them are team specific. And boy, I sure could have used one. I was a very anxious athlete. And I remember times when I would be getting in the blocks and my hands would be shaking. Um, I remember being very sleep deprived, both in high school and college. I remember being stressed from just trying to balance everything. You know, academics, social life, um, sports, practice, you know, the competition, everything. And, and that's no different than, you know, collegiate students, anywhere, athlete or non-athlete. You know, everybody's balancing a lot. And you know you might need some extra support when it, it becomes unmanageable and the overwhelm starts to consume you. And I think it's so important for any athletic organization, but any organization, to have some things in place. And I, I am really so impressed by everything that you have here at your disposal. It's very rare, and you know, when I initially spoke with some of the folks at this table, I, I really was blown away when they were telling me about all of the things that, that have been implemented here. And, and one of the things I like the most is that it's not just, um, here's what we have, here's, you can take advantage of it. It's also um, student involved. And so the student body has a good amount of ownership over that, what they do with it. Um, knowing the needs of the student body, of the community. And, um, and that's why, um, you know, and Lance will speak to this too, it's, I'm very conscientious of when it's possible to have um, athletes as advocates because, you know, athletes look up to each other and I think that they know best, you know, where the struggles are and, um, and it helps to have team leaders. So, um, and after I got my degrees, um, I started a private practice, and then, um, and then I joined the Rams. And my latest uh, endeavor is I recently opened a community uh, facility for athletes and the athletic community where we provide mental health support and mental performance guidance specifically for that population. Um, and I just, I've noticed now finally we're seeing professional sports and even collegiate sports incorporate some more resources like this, but there's really very little for the younger ages. And, and boy, do they need it too. I mean, same types of struggles. And, and the thing is, if we have some of these things in place, we can nip some of these issues in the bud before they become bad habits later. And, you know, if someone has a traumatic experience, say, um, in, in their uh, high school or younger years, rather than, I think of the analogy almost like a trapeze, rather than let them fall off, hit the ground, and then try to help them up and, you know, patch them up, and it's, it just makes more sense to kind of be there ready to catch them. And so having, having some of these, you know, relationships and uh, tools for them to go to if and when something uh, they should be faced with any sort of challenge, even just your everyday stress, I think is so important. And so that was kind of my inspiration in, in opening that facility um, in Westlake Village. Lance um, had a friend who went uh, through some stuff and, and was, you know, had a connection with someone who took their life. And so he, um, through that, really developed an awareness and an advocacy for, um, for mental health and total wellness and how it impacts, you know, your functioning throughout a day. Um, All right. Hello. Can you guys hear me? There we go. We got you. Well, what up, everyone? My name is Lance McCutcheon. I'm a wide receiver here for the Los Angeles Rams and uh, here to talk to you guys a little bit about mental health. And so why, you know, I'm joining Dr. Kerry today to come on here and talk to you guys a little bit about mental health and why this topic is important to me is because uh, when I was in eighth grade, um, my best friend committed suicide. You know, he's kind of battling uh, mental health for 
a little under a year. And, you know, when, uh, when we were all aware of what he was going through and how it was affecting him and his family, you know, we were kind of too late. And um, so the little analogy that Dr. Carey just said about, you know, your friends walking on the trapeze or the tightrope or whatever it is, I like to look at it as a, instead of being there for the, like catching them at the bottom, you know, when, the, when they fall in and you're trying to, you know, help them get back together, be there for them before they even, you know, walk out on that tightrope, you know, um, be, be a voice, just be a, be a shoulder for them, be, be whatever you can be, you know, to help that person out, to help them get off before they even get on that, uh, that tightrope, you know, and, and go, go through that mental health battle, you know, whatever it is, however long it takes, you know, just be there, um, for them before, um, before they go out there. Thanks Lance. I'll go to him with some of the topics that I'm going to cover. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the things that, uh, that we work on at the Rams, um, both collectively and some of the things I see the most among our players um, and, and coaches and staff uh, and how we, we all work together. Um, so my role as the team psychologist uh, has definitely grown over the years as we've been able to identify more of the specific needs and, um, and figure out how to uh, support everybody. Um, I, my number one priority is the players and meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's not mandatory. People either um, can elect to come on on their, on their own. Some people are very heavily nudged, um, unless it's like court ordered or something. Um, you know, it's, it's not mandatory. But over the years, I've seen more people every year um, and very few people care about um, anybody seeing them walk in my office or, um, you know, and some people will talk to others. It's, it's that to me, um, is such a sign of us going in the right direction that not only are they using the resource, but they're not hiding it. And, and that's where we as a society need to get to. Um, I also, I meet with the rookies every year, um, multiple times. The league mandates that I do specific modules of, as part of our rookie success program, anything ranging from um, decision-making, stress management, uh, mental health, um, relationships, things like that, and then I can choose some of my own as well. So um, I get to know the rookies pretty well, and then, um, and, uh, and then I'll also meet with coaches sometimes and, um, and staff members. I, I love that the vibe at the Rams is very collaborative. And so I work closely with our training staff. Um, our director of nutrition and wellness is also a huge advocate of, of you know, total wellness inside and out. So he and I will collaborate. Um, we recently gave a workshop on sleep and how that impacts performance and mental health. Um, from our different perspectives. So I, I feel really lucky in that sense. I know not every club is like this where it's so harmonious and everybody really is um, supportive. Uh, I know sometimes there can be a divide between the medical staff and mental health or the training staff um, and mental health and coaches. And, and I really feel we do a good job of working together in terms of, um, you know, getting people to their best position to play. Um, so those are some of the things that I typically do in, in terms of when I'm in a session, you know, using empathy, setting goals. Um, I'm often asked what a typical day looks like. It's really uh, easier for me to explain it in a typical week. Typical week being that the game is on Sunday and then Monday, they have meetings and review, and, and then I'll meet with players after those meetings. Um, Tuesday is the player day off, and that's typically my busiest day um, from start to finish. And then Wednesday and Thursday are usually the hard practice days. So I don't see, um, I usually don't see people or maybe just a couple after practice, but uh, they're usually tired and want to go home. Um, and then Fridays is a morning walkthrough, and then I'll see people after that, and I'll usually attend um, a practice, um, you know, either weekly or biweekly, and um, depending on what's going on and what I'm, what I'm trying to watch, um, and then thrown in there are other things like um, 
workshops and trainings. Uh, sometimes I'll do a staff training on um, anything. For, I did a staff training for our um, trainers on mental rest. Uh, and particularly the Super Bowl year, you know, come January, everybody was just so fried. And it's like when you are the shortest on sleep and energy and trying to work harder than ever because of, you know, the prize in sight. And uh, so I did a stress management workshop with, um, with people during that time. And that's, that's what we've tried to do, too, is kind of incorporate uh, those types of things into the, the work day because realistically, people aren't going to take the time to do stuff on their own um, or they really don't have any extra time. So it's like, um, you know, I might teach them a mental rest exercise that they can do on their drive home um, so that they don't feel like they're sacrificing any time, um, but yet they can still engage in some sort of self-care. Um, some of the things I do with the rookies, there's one called um, Identity Pie that I, uh, I've been doing now for a few years where I'll have the rookies um, draw a circle on a piece of paper and they put their name in the middle and on the inside go all of the personal qualities and on the outside more external uh, qualities and I basically just ask rapid fire questions about themselves. Anything as basic as, you know, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite movie? Where's your favorite place to travel? But I really ask it quickly because most people can answer those things, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. You've thought about it. Often, when you get to this level of athletics or, um, you know, where your entire focus is on one thing, all these athletes have been asked about is football. And that's all they ever talk about. And so it's easy to lose their identity within all that. And not to say that football isn't a huge part of their identity, but it's never all of their identity. And it's important that they tap into some of those other aspects about themselves because at some point football is going to end. And whether that is suddenly, you know, that week or if it's when they choose to retire, they need to be left with a sense of self. And, and often, you know, when players are done, they, they don't know what to do. They don't know who they are. And so... Um, I find that just reminding them through an exercise like that uh, of all of their other, the other pieces of themselves um, can be helpful. And then uh, lost, at sea, lost at Sea exercise is one where um, it actually was originated with the Coast Guard where they have to, I usually pair them up and then we talk about, um, there's a given list of things. If you were lost at sea, what, in what order would you need these things? And, and so they get together, and then they, from that list, they rank them, and then we see how accurate it was. But really, the point in that is I do this early in the season. So it's can you make decisions together? Can you collaborate with someone new and develop a relationship there where, you know, these guys, some of these guys have never been out of, the, out of state before. So it's a huge transition. And so, um, you know, doing a lot of collaborative things like that um, as part of, especially, especially with incoming players. I'm going to talk about the things I see the most, and then Lance, I'm going to um, go to you to hear about some of the things that uh, you've either experienced or that you see in, uh, in your teammates. But anxiety, for sure, is number one. Um, and that comes in all shapes and forms. But anything from anxiety that may be very deep-rooted and been there for a while, or, you know, performance anxiety, anxiety about that particular game, um, it, all of the above. And so relaxation exercises is a, is a big tool that I teach, uh, teach our athletes and um, healthy self-talk and, and things like that. Um, and then coping with injury is definitely uh, up there as well. When players get injured, it's kind of that same thing in terms of talking about sense of identity, sense of self. Um, if somebody's out for six months um, or it's a season-ending injury um, or even in rare cases a, a career-ending injury, um, you know, that can be so hard for people who have spent their whole lives working for that moment. And so um, it's really just about slowing it down 
for players and taking it one day at a time and staying in the present. Because if you are fully grounded in the present, you can't be dwelling on what happened. You can't be worried about the future or you know, ruminating over this timeline. All you can do is what you can do in that moment. And, and you know, it can be hard for players to recognize progress. Um, and so we might reflect like, hey, I remember a particular player I worked with um, who had a knee injury and, uh, and it really brought him down and he was in, in a pretty dark place for a while um, and felt like he wasn't getting anywhere. And, you know, he, the first time he came in, he couldn't even walk, he was on crutches, he had just had surgery and um, was really just down and out and uh, didn't feel part of the team anymore. And he had a long road ahead. And, you know, in terms of that long road, I'll also say, uh, which the trainers and I know all too well, is if you tell a player they've got six weeks of recovery, they hear four. And they're used to being the best. And so, and they're used to winning. And they're so competitive, like, okay, I'm going to win at healing. I'm going to beat that timeline. And sometimes, realistically, that's just not possible. And so then they can feel like a failure because they didn't beat the timeline. And so it's almost like, you know, you've got to rationalize even the healing process. Um, but uh, I, I think that helping this player that I have in mind, um, he one of the biggest fears is, you know, will I come back as strong? Um, and, and there's no way to know that. There's no way to answer that until it happens. And so it's kind of just joining them where they are and like how helpless a feeling that is. Um, and, and so, you know, the player would come back and it was probably a couple weeks later and um, he felt like I just I felt like time was standing still. And I said, well, I remember the first time you came in here, you were on crutches and you couldn't walk. You know, where are the crutches? They were gone, and it was a subtle, subtle change, but he hadn't even really thought of that because he still couldn't walk very well. But then the following week, after we talked about recognizing signs of progress and celebrating these small victories, he said, you know what? For the first time this week, I stood up and I made myself a sandwich in the kitchen. And um, up to until that point, his girlfriend had been, you know, really waiting on him hand and foot. And, and that was such a sign, a feeling of independence and autonomy that he hadn't felt in a while. And so just recognizing that. And then to fast forward to the end, um, he did come back, not only as well, but he did come back stronger. And um, one of his first games back, he, uh, he was recognized for the comeback. And so that was a real success story. Um, that I think was inspirational to um, people who had been part of that journey with him. Um, and then, you know, there's always the stuff going on behind the scenes with personal issues uh, that come up and that can just mentally interfere with somebody's performance um, or even practice, focus at practice. Um, so we'll work through that stuff. And then just general stress. You know, that whole transition, that whole phase of life is very stressful. Um, so Lance, uh, we want to hear from you in terms of, I, if you can share what that transition was like for you um, and kind of where you are now in comparison and how you got there. Yeah, so uh, for those of you guys that don't know, I was a rookie last year. I'm going into my second season uh, right now. But uh, for me, it was, it was a different uh, little journey for me. Um, you know, coming from high school and college, kind of all athletes in general, you know, you're kind of, you're usually the, uh, usually the best player, you know, high school and college on your team. But now you get, you get to the NFL, you know, you're surrounded by a bunch of guys who have always been the best player. So Dr. Carey's talking about that comparison thing. And so for me, you know, I'm trying to compare myself to the other receivers in my room. You know, I'm trying to compare myself to, to Cooper Cub, Allen Robinson, Van Jefferson. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my routes and my releases and just my technique and everything else that, you know, to make it look just like, you know, these elite guys in the league. And so for one, for me, just, you know, trying to trying to elevate my game, you know, and get it to, you know, look just like theirs was something that I struggled with. 
Um, for me, I think the biggest thing I struggled with was the uh, transition from uh, from college to the league. So one, just being the speed of the game. Um, two, just having more understanding and more knowledge as far as like the playbook and what what the defense is doing on, on this look and in this coverage and just trying to analyze and just go through everything that I can, you know, in in five, 10 seconds before the play is getting called or the ball's getting snapped, excuse me. So, um, so yeah, for me, my, the biggest thing for me was definitely the comparison, just the, the speed and flow of the game, the, the terminology. Um, we here at the Rams are, we, I would say we run a little more complicated offense. So, um, like last year, me being the only rookie in the room, that was hard for me to kind of be at the bottom of the totem pole when everyone else is all the way at the top and they've are they've been through it at least for a year, at least for a season, they've been through it. And so, you know, they don't want the coaching staff and everyone else in the room isn't going to, you know, sit there and just uh, try to wait for, you know, the rookie to catch up and get with everyone else. So it was kind of, you know, learning my own pace, but at, at a fast pace, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, right now that's really all I can think of as far as, what was the hardest for me as far as the transition from college to the league. Thanks. That's great. Um, and I think, and that's such a good point, that comparison, not just to the other players, but I often see th it's the comparison against yourself, against your former self, against your collegiate athlete self, where, you know, you make it to the NFL, you were among the best of the best on your team, you know, at your college, wherever you came from. And so you know, not all those guys are going to be starters when they get to the NFL. And that that's a huge mental adjustment. Um, and so really practicing self-acceptance and self-compassion and patience and setting goals um, to work towards so that you don't feel stuck in those in those places. Um, and performance anxiety, which uh, you know, we've probably all felt at some point um, it doesn't necessarily have to be with, uh, have to do with sports. Um, you don't even necessarily have to be in front of people. It, the key thing about performance anxiety is that you know you're being evaluated. You know that um, you're being judged one way or the other. You know, it might be positive outcomes, but it's that pressure, pressure to perform, pre pressure to impress, uh, pressure to, you know, have your best game, get a personal best. Um, and, and so that's, uh, that's really what makes performance anxiety unique. So signs of stress, stress and anxiety always start with physical symptoms. A lot of people feel it in their chest, their chest gets tight, they might get short of breath. Um, might get stomach aches, they might start sweating, uh, you know, everybody experiences it in their own way, but the first signs tend to be physical. And so, you know, I remind our athletes to pay attention to those physical signs. Now, as an athlete, that can be extra tricky because how do you, how do you differentiate then between a, a panic attack and you just had a really hard workout? very similar symptoms. You know, you might be out of breath, you might be struggling to breathe. And so I try to educate coaches on recognizing some of those signs of uh, distress and how to tease them out. Um, and then, uh, you know, educate players on it. if they're experiencing that, what can they do? Um, and so again, it's like, it's like Lance said too, in terms of that tightrope, you know, you ideally we want to get to a place where you're helping with prevention rather than just responding uh, to consequences. So this is a, a breathing exercise um, that I do. Or these are a couple, um, but breathing exercises I definitely teach every year because it's just a great foundation for anything, for all additional tools. Um, and you can add, I like to add imagery to them. We might, um, if we've done a breathing exercise, you know, I might encourage somebody to, to settle into that first before watching film. And then, you know, watching film in that relaxed state so that then maybe later that night, if they're doing some imagery work, they'll already be in a relaxed, grounded place 
um, and that will be associated with those images. Um, so the, there are little tricks of the trade. Um, I thought just uh, since, since we all can identify with stress, um, I'll just teach you a little bit about good breathing. Um, so just kind of sit in your chair comfortably and just kind of notice as you take your inhales and exhales, notice where they're going. Are they going in your chest? Are your shoulders rising? Is it hard to get the breath in? Just kind of pay attention. What you want is for the breath when you inhale to go into your belly. That spot right behind your belly button. And you want to try to fill that with air, slowly and, and controlled. And it's much easier said than done if, you, if you've never done it. And it is a skill that you almost have to train your, your body to be able to do. Um, some people like to do it lying down. Some people will sit and do it. You can put music on while you do it. But this is something that is good to practice regularly. I would say even if you had a few minutes most days, um, even if you're doing something else at the time, even if you're driving, like just checking in with your breath and trying to make it low and slow. Because when we're anxious or stressed, it gets high and fast. And then once you master that, then you can start actually doing some breathing techniques. So for example, rhythmic breathing is where it's, it's very um, controlled and managed. So you might inhale ideally through your nose for about a four count, hold it for about four, and then exhale for about a four, four or a five. And when you exhale, you don't want it to all come out at once. You can almost imagine um, a candle in front of you, about arm's length away, and, and you want to try to make that candle flicker. You don't want it to blow out, or that means too much air is coming out at once. So you just want to make that candle flicker um, and just keep that control. When everything else feels out of control, if you have control over your breathing, you have control over something. And that alone can do wonders with your mental state. Um, so that's something you can practice. We also do, there's progressive muscle relaxation where uh, you tense different muscle groups as you're breathing and then you release. I like to add some imagery to that where I make the air coming in, I give it a color. Um, so I might say the air you're inhaling is blue. Um, when you exhale, you're gonna exhale the stress and the stress is red and really being able to see that um, as you exhale and see it come out of your body and dissipate um, into the air. So, so those types of exercises, um, and, and there's the five to one count there too. Um, Self-talk is another big tool that, um, that I teach my players. Uh, you know, it's, I think the more of a perfectionist you are, the more self-critical you can be. And, um, and, and that's an easy, uh, it's easy to get in a slump that way and just be super negative about everything. So, you know, we help identify any negative thoughts, um, challenge them, and then replace them with more adaptive thinking. And that doesn't necessarily mean making everything sunshine and rainbows. It's more of a realistic way of thinking and disputing irrational thoughts and, um, you know, reminding yourself of what you're capable of, even if you're, you're not there yet. Um, and also reminding yourself of the controllable factors and the uncontrollables. You know, things like weather, things like officiators and calls, those are out of your control. And so, you know, there's, it's not, there's no point in wasting your time and energy stressing over that uh, when you can be mastering other skills to help yourself, like self-talk and some of these tools. Um, you probably, I don't know if you can see this, but this, I like this little cartoon. It's uh, the referee as seen by, as seen by the ref, him or herself, uh, as a superhero, as seen by a parent. Um, they see the ref as having an agenda, and I, and I hate your kid. And then the player sees the uh, ref as blind. Um, so let's go to Lance again. I'm going to talk about goal setting. Um, Lance, maybe you can speak to your personal, um, 
experiences in terms of achieving focus and relaxation and how you've used your own self-talk and, um, and goal setting to, uh, to help yourself out? Yeah. So uh, first I'll talk about that positive self-talk. So for me, um, just, just I guess the most important thing I can get across here is just positive self-talk is just the most important thing when it comes to when it comes to like your sport, you know, self-confidence is like it is up there with with your your skill and your technique, you know, as, as far as being an athlete. But uh, I mean, all of you, I'm sure all of you guys, you know, either working out or running or, or doing some kind of, you know, phys physical activity you don't want to do. There's always that little voice in your head that's saying like, you like give up, quit, you know, on and on. It'll tell you whatever you want to hear. But uh, just, you know, fight that, fight that little voice, you know, that, that's in the, in the back of your head. You know, get it to a point to where, you know, you don't, you don't even hear it anymore. Um, you know, as far as um, like goal achieving and goal setting, for me, I'm a big believer in like writing stuff down. I had a coach in college say that writing crystallizes your thinking. So the more you write it down, the more you're going to remember in your brain as far as that, as far as just looking at it and like reading it, you know. And so for me, I'm a, I, I like every year I like to sit down and write out um, goals down on paper, like actually have it there, write it out and then pin it to my wall, like right in front of my uh, right on the side of the wall next to my door, like in my bedroom. That way, you know, whenever I leave my room, I see it. I see it. It's something I see every single day. You know, I'm paying attention to it. I, whenever, you know, I walk into my room, out of my room, I grab a hoodie or w whatever I got to do. Um, you know, I'm seeing my goals, you know, whether that's two, four, whatever. Your goals can go on and on. Um, sorry, Dr. Carey, what was the, uh, the other thing you wanted me to hit on? Uh, no, that that was it. The self talk and the goals, and any I, just if there's anything else that um, has helped you along the way, through from your first season to now. Um, yeah, so just re repetition, repetition and practice. Obviously, um, during the season and during just a regular week of practice is where you, uh, you know, you get better at better at your you know your craft is what we say, but. Um, Another another rule I like to you know I still brought now like to the NFL, but a rule I carried from with myself in college was um, like you got to do more than what everyone else is doing. So let's just say like football for example, everyone on the team is required to lift, meet, watch film with your coach, practice, and then if you're hurt, you have you have the training room. But for me, what are you going to do that's going to separate yourself from the rest of your the rest of the team? So yes, you're already watching film like with your coach. How much film are you watching? You know, outside of outside of the the building, outside of practice, um, are you taking care of your body regardless if you're hurt or not? Like you you are like in the NFL, we play 17 17 games. So yeah, you might be feeling fine week four, but if you don't take care of your body, are you going to feel fine week 17? And then um, the weight room, do more in the weight room. And that, that doesn't mean, you know, lift more weight, do more reps. That could be do something that's going to benefit. You know, if you got something going on with your shoulder, do some of your shoulders, you know, um, do a lot of body maintenance. And the weight room can mean stretching. I mean, yoga, grab a band, grab a roller, do whatever. Like for me, I, I love yoga. I took three semesters of yoga in college. And honestly, I wish I would have taken, you know, eight of them, however long I was in college. But um, I, I really love yoga, you know, sit down for 10, 15 minutes in a nice, quiet area, quiet space and clear your mind. And you just, you know, you just listen to yourself, listen to your body. Um, your, your body's going to tell you exactly how you're feeling. And um, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in that yoga. Yoga really helps um, with athletics. You notice how he mentioned a lot of the things that have helped him are not the intense practice rituals. It's actually the more passive, um, you know, whether it's yoga, some form of calming or soothing, um, mental rest is, it's almost like active rest to where, yes, sleep is, is important and one form, but the, the active rest is kind of just shifting your focus. So if you are all consumed by your sport or by your job or by your schoolwork, the best thing for you actually is to take a break, is to completely shift your focus with all of your senses to something else. And that may be for a time-limited period, but 
it's contrary to the belief of like the more I do the you know every waking moment spent doing this thing that is consuming me that's actually not going to be to your benefit and um, and you know in terms of goal setting as Lance was saying uh, he writes things down and there is such power to uh, making goals visual um, but you know goals we all know goals are important but how many of us actually take the time to intentionally make specific goals and and focus on the steps to get there goal setting i think the most important part of goal setting is making goals specific and that involves breaking them down until you can't break them down anymore so let's say um you know uh, your goal is to make cheeseburgers tonight. Well, okay, that's great. That's a good overall, maybe somewhat long-term goal. Um, so what do you need to do to make those cheeseburgers? Well, you need the ingredients. So how do I get the ingredients? Okay, I need to go to the store. How am I going to go to the store when I have these appointments this day? Um, well, I can probably fit it in here at this time. Um, and then I'll need to you know, prep and I'll need to, and so it'll take this much time. So you see how I'm like, you're starting with the goal or the solution and working backwards and breaking it down. Um, and that also helps you feel the forward progress as you check off each step. Um, and you have to believe they're attainable. You know, it might not be achievable that day or that week, but you have to believe that it's possible. Um, how many of you have heard of SMART goals? Yeah, most of you. I, I really love that acronym. I think that um, it's, it's such a charm when it comes to um, working your way through goals and being patient with that process. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. So, you know, again, the specificity, making it relevant to the task, you got to believe it's achievable um, and relevant. You know, you also want to make sure that uh, mentally you are thinking in ways that are mentally relevant. Time bound. You know, within what time frame do I want this to happen? Um, there are both task involved goals and ego involved goals. So basically, one is where you're competing against someone else or comparing yourself and wanting to do better, and one is that like self-comparison and self-competition and wanting to do your own personal best. Um, and this is kind of like what I was just saying. You've got your long-term outcome goals. So, you know, if our goal is to win the Super Bowl, well, great, that's a long-term goal that, uh, you know, we can work towards, but that's not going to happen today. And so you work backwards. What do I need to do? Um, what do I need to work on? What are some team goals? And one of my favorites, what are some mental goals? You want to set those two, mental goals, moral goals, those invisible, uh, intangible things are so important. And those are the things in the end that can put you, you know, over the edge in terms of like, if you've got two athletes of the exact same ability, the one with a better mindset is going to win every time. So again, the visual, like Lance said, it really does help the goals crystallize, you're getting things from the inside out. You're seeing them. Um, if you put it up, it's motivating. Uh, there's something about it, even neurologically, where people show more success with goals when they make them visible. You know, and you can, you can put them in your phone, but the reason I don't like that as much is that you have to go looking for it. You know, it's not right in front of you. You have to remember to look up the goals, and, uh, and so I prefer to have something posted, uh, something that you can see regularly. Lance said he walks by his every day, um, and making them very personal. Um, sleep, just a note on sleep. Uh, I talked about mental rest, physical and mental rest. I think it's so undervalued what sleep does, both short-term and long-term. I mean, even, you may not even be realizing it, but if you're sleep deprived, your reflexes just aren't going to be as quick. Your uh, ability to remember plays, um, all sorts of things that, uh, you know, in terms of even your storage of, of memories or experiences, um, 
communication tactics, all everything is affected by sleep. And, and people tend to still put it last, uh, trying to cram in as much as they can uh, do during a day. So don't, don't undervalue sleep um, and what that can do for your mind and your body. Talked about mental rest. So um, I I'm going to talk about some of my challenges. And Lance, I want you to talk about some of your challenges from a player perspective. Um, from my perspective, my role as uh, the psychologist is different than if I were a psychologist in a private practice, where typically you avoid dual relationships. Um, you might not see two people that where you know them both. You wouldn't necessarily uh, treat a friend. And in in this environment, you know, I might be uh, working with. I, I'm definitely working with colleagues, um, whether it's two players that play together or, you know, staff or coaches. Um, it gets interesting when if somebody's coming in because they've got beef with um, another person and then that person comes in to talk about the beef with the other person. And, you know, that can take some serious acting skills on my part for acting surprised about something that they don't know I already know or, you know, um, but just really, I have to be very aware of my own bias and making sure that it's, uh, you know, to keep myself in check in terms of um, providing a fair and safe environment. Um, and, you know, I, my colleagues also are my friends. And so, you know, that's also, I have to navigate that in a special way, in a unique way that um, people in other environments don't necessarily have to do. Um, it's, it is more solution focused work. Um, we've got to get these players, you know, their readiness to play comes first. Not, uh, not that their mental health doesn't, but that is part of the readiness to play. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, let's say somebody's a starter and they really depend on that person. And we've had this happen where if, if somebody has to miss a game, maybe for personal reasons and, um, and maybe it's something we're really keeping tight and, you know, so the media, the public, they don't know what's going on um, or they make up their own story of what they think is going on. Um, but then, uh, and that player missed a game, you know, everybody was totally supportive, um, no questions asked, like the coaching staff, everybody. Then another week, um, and by the third week where we really needed this person, it starts to be like, hey, we support him 110%, but at the same time, like, this is his job, and and he needs to come to work at some point. And so, you know, that can turn into a really interesting conversation, but um, but we do really try to put the, the player first and their, and their families. Um, communication with uh, other staff members, particularly the, the medical and training staff, um, can be tricky for me because, you know, Everything is confidential in terms of what I talk with players about. And, and I emphasize that from the start because I think that is the whole point, is giving them a safe, confidential space um, to bring up whatever they want. Uh, sometimes if I hear assumptions being made by, uh, you know, other, other folks in the organization um, and they're not accurate, that's hard because I can't speak to anything without the player's permission. Sometimes, you know, I'll say, hey, do you want me to talk to, you know, this person, or are you okay with I t if I talk to them? And if, and then I'll have them sign a release, and then I can communicate about the player. But unless that happens, you know, I I preserve that confidentiality, um, and so just have to kind of bear sometimes some of those other uh, other assumptions and discussions. We do have a monthly roster review that we do. Um, it's usually just about five of us. In addition to myself, it's um, our VP of uh, sports medicine, our team physician, our strength and conditioning coach, and um, our director of football affairs. And it's mainly the people who see and interact with the players the most. Um, and we literally, uh, red light, yellow light, green light, the players, um, as we go through the roster. And like, hey, you know, this guy um, just seems a little off. Let's keep an eye on him. Or we know this player um, lost a family member 
um, the other day. Let's give him some extra love. So that we're all on the same page and we can provide um, what we can provide, you know, to to help support that player and check in with them. If they're red lighted, you know, we definitely, uh, we make a plan in terms of how to best support them. And then, you know, there's always those outliers in terms of, you know, every year there's a curveball, at least one. Um, 2018, there were the, the fires and our whole area was evacuated. So it was like scrambling to find players, places to stay. Um, the borderline shooting happened like the day after the fires started. Um, so, you know, being ready for those curveballs and being able to uh, make a plan. Every team now, um, since the CBA was uh, revamped in 2019, every team has some sort of mental health resource at their disposal. It's up to each club how they want that to look. Um, so it looks a little differently with each team. but. Um, Every team also is now required to have a mental health emergency action plan. And I think that's so important at whatever level of sport you're in. Um, you know, we also have our, our crisis response plan, um, but specific to mental health crisis. And, you know, we've got like a, a tree of communication, um, who would be notified in what order, when we need to bring in the coaches, when they don't need to be brought in. Um, and every year we have to do a tabletop drill of a specific scenario where we literally run through it and go through the motions of, of how we would handle that. And then of course COVID and the social justice initiatives and Damar Hamlin, um, which affected everyone this year. Lance, um, will you just speak, speak quickly on some of the challenges maybe you face as a player? Yeah, you talking uh, just in general as a football player or just like my what happened to me my first year? I think both. I think as a player, but also, yeah, just how everything comes together. All right, so I'll hit on just as like a player in general. Uh, so for me, um, I, I never want to be that kind of, I guess, that athlete on the field that doesn't, you know, execute their job, execute their assignment, you know, Let's say I'm blocking on the edge and I don't, you know, correctly block my, the guy, uh, you know, ahead of me and my man ends up blowing up the running back. You know, I never want, um, how am I trying to put this? I never want to be the reason why we never had a positive play, if that makes sense. You know, I never want to um, not, you know, know my assignment, not go to the right guy, not run the right route. So a lot of that all falls off of what I said earlier to, you know, how much am I, studying how how much film am I watching outside of what we do now um an another thing just as a general uh football player I guess um you you always want to be just as an athlete in general you always want to be that you know the star you always want to be the guy on the field whether you know that's field basketball but you know whatever it is you always want to be that number one guy and so when you're not um, it, it's hard for, it's hard for young players, especially to like own and accept their role. So like for me in college, you know, I was, I'm a young freshman and sophomore, you know, I'm okay as a receiver, but the receivers that are older and ahead of me are obviously better. And that's where the coaches are going to play. And so on one side, I can, I can, I can, I can hit the portal, you know, I can leave, you know, I don't want to compete. I, I don't want to go to this school anymore because I'm not, I'm not going to be the starting guy so I can leave. Or you can you can complain and whatever at practice or to the coach or you can talk bad about the guys who are ahead of you or the coach who's not playing you or or whatever it is. Or you can own and accept the role that you're you know given and the one that you're like put in. And if that's you know you're uh, you're on special teams and your assignment is to you're supposed to run down and cover the kick on kickoff or you're on punt return and you're supposed to you know come off the edge and try to get a block. You can either, you can look at it two ways. You can either complain about it and not, you know, take anything from it, or you can accept the role that you have and you can earn a different role by executing the role you're in now, if you guys are following exactly what I'm saying. Um, so I'll move on from just as an athlete. So uh, my rookie year was last year, like I said, and I would say the hardest thing for me, this is going to sound kind of cheesy, you know, kind of laughing, uh, thinking about what I'm going to say to you guys, but uh, 
the biggest thing for me was getting over the uh the like star the starstruck feeling about some of the guys who are now my teammates you know i've been watching matthew stafford cooper cup Allen robinson Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald, the list can go on and on and on about, you know, big name guys in the league. And I'm walking around the locker room and like, like, wow, that's, that, that's really Matthew Stafford. Like, wow, I'm really in a meeting sitting next to Cooper Cup. Like, I, I won't lie to you guys. At first, I would say like two weeks, I was a little starstruck. It's just, you know, wow, I can't believe I'm here, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Um, I would, would like to admit that I am past that stage. I, w I don't want you guys, you know, think that I'm just a, a fanboy to all my teammates now. But um, I would say the next thing that was a challenge to me was was learning the playbook. You know, like I mentioned, the Rams have a very complicated offense. And as a rookie, and especially for me as a rookie, you know, as the only rookie in the room, trying to learn that playbook a lot on my own was was very challenging. And, um, you know, I did mess up a couple of times in practice, a couple of times, a time or two in the games. But, um, yeah, you know, like, like I just said, no one wants to be that, that person who doesn't know what they're doing. You know, no one wants to be the one guy that the entire team is looking at while the coach is, you know, cussing them out. You know, no one wants to be put in that position. Um, so, yeah, I would say that starstruck feeling, uh, learning, learning the offense for sure, and then really just how to be a pro, you know, how to be like, what does being a professional football player like mean? Like, what, what does that look like? And so for me, I, I, you know, I'm still going through it. We still have, you know, five year guys on this team that are going through it. Like it's, it's different for everyone. It's, it's going to be different for everyone, but, you know, just learning about how, how I go about my business, you know, what does it mean to, to come in and get extra work? You know, that doesn't mean go out and run rap, run routes, you know, kill my legs or go to the weight room, you know, kill, kill my body. What is, I, I can come in, you know, and I could, I could stretch, you know, take advantage of the, the training staff and what they offer as far as recovery and treatment. Um, you know, what is that, what does that mean on, you know, when I'm not at the facility, what am I eating? How am I sleeping? What am I doing in my free time? Am I watching film? Am I, um, using my whiteboard and drawing out my plays, you know, like what am I doing in my in my off time, in my free time that you know is, is going to make me better? That's going to keep me a pro. You know, they say the NFL stands for not for long, and so you know how how long you want to stay in this league is in, in general. However, however long you want to stay doing something, it all depends on how much you put into it. You know, what you get out is what you put in. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your attention and your time, and thanks so much for having me.